Okay, so our the second paper is um, the second presentation is by Fikrab Solomon, and he will talk about a paper that he read about emergence of convolutional structures. Um, so go ahead, Fikrab. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to this talk. I recently got interested in this topic, and um, I am studying the theory myself. So I'd like to thank Professor Van Churin for inviting me to present on this topic. Um, the talk is based on an article by uh, Ingrosso and Gold. It's available on PNAS. Um, uh, both of them happen to be uh, in ICTP and CISA interest early. I actually did my master's in ICTP and took some PhD courses in CISA. Both of them are great schools, but this is just a coincidence. I did not choose the paper for that reason. <laughs> um, so we already know the emphasis on the talk. The, oh, the emphasis is the mathematics behind uh, machine learning concepts. So uh, I'm gonna try to focus on that. Uh, my presentation will be greatly simplified. If everyone knows convolutional neural networks, uh, shall I skip the introduction or um, maybe give an overview of uh, convolutional neural networks? Okay, I'll just go over a brief overview. Uh, so let's start with a machine learning model. Um, so a machine learning model is a mathematical representation of a system that does two specific tasks. Uh, it learns from data and also makes predictions or decisions uh, about new unseen data. Uh, the model is trained using a data set and the data set is presented in uh, input output pairs. Um, one family of examples of a machine learning model are neural networks. Um, they are inspired by uh, the structure and function of, of the brain. So one fact we know about the brain is that it changes over time. That means the neural network in our brain changes over time um, based on the stimuli uh, or data that it's, it's fed. So some structural changes in our brain are uh, data-driven and emergent. So they are not part of you know, the blueprint we're born with. Um, so uh, the connectivity pattern among neurons in a convolutional neural network, it looks like the organization of the neural network, for example, in the eye. Um, so, so in this talk, we're gonna uh, uh, talk about convolutional neural networks. Um, so what is a CNN? So it's a neural network designed to process data with a grid-like topology. For example, the picture on your phone has that kind of structure. Um, it's composed of multiple layers. You've got the boundary, which has the input and output layer. Um, and the other layers, such as the convolutional layer, pooling layer, and the fully connected layers. Um, the convolutional layers allow you to, uh, the network to learn some uh, spatial hierarchies of features, for example, edges, textures, um, parts of objects are learned through a convolutional layer. Um, the pooling layer or the layers, uh, they reduce the sp uh, spatial size of the representation. For example, it will help you with the computational cost of the network. It prevents overfitting and so on. Um, finally, the fully connected layers are uh, the ones that connect every neuron in one layer to every neuron in the other layer, and they allow the network to learn nonlinear combinations of features uh, that, were, that were learned by previous layers, right? Um, so convolutional net neural networks are widely used in computer vision, uh, and they have several applications that are listed here. Uh, in image and video recognition and so on. Um, 
the two uh, hallmarks of uh, or characteristics of convolutional linear networks are uh, the fact that they have filters um, and um, the tiling of the input space. So if you have not um, run your first or trained your first convolutional linear network, I have an example for you. I'm gonna put this in the chat. This is a nice example on Google Colab. Um, so, um, so uh, convolutional neural networks are an upgrade from uh, fully connected networks. They do not develop uh, because uh, of these two characteristics, for example, Fully connected networks or FC networks do not have um, convolutions. They do not even develop it unless you have some kind of regularization uh, built in, such as weight pruning. They also perform significantly worse than uh, CNNs on, on many tasks, uh, including image uh, classification. So they're the, one of the major open problems in uh, Machine learning was whether you can learn convolution from from scratch, meaning from from the input without without intrinsically uh, including it in the uh, machine learning model. So what Ingrosso and Gold answer in their article is that if, by showing that if the inputs are special, then you can indeed learn uh, convolutional structure. If not, uh, then you can't. So. Uh, it doesn't mean we can't learn convolutional structure, but we can only uh, on specific uh, cases. Can you explain yeah. once again? I, I want to understand this topic, uh, this point better. Uh, when can it and when can it not learn the convolutional structures? Uh, can, can so, it yes, it's the answer is on the next page. Oh, okay, all right. So, all right. So the goal of the article is to show that fully connected ne ne neural networks can learn uh, convolutional structure. Uh, when the input data has non-Gaussian higher order statistics. So we're gonna show this by an example later. Um, so- So you're gonna tell input... us what the non-Gaussian means? Yes, okay. yes. Okay. All right. Yes, so- In this context, yeah. Right, yeah. So here is the setup. The setup is they design a binary classification task that fulfills this criteria. They have also a, a controlled uh, experiment or a controlled task. And then they show that the higher order statistics of the inputs uh, uh, bring about the emergence of these uh, tiling structures or what we call receptive fields, okay? So here is a neural network architecture we're gonna work with. Uh, it's a two layer FC network with K hidden neurons and the activation map is a, a sigmoidal uh, activation map. Um, this is the easiest mo model that uh, will show this uh, uh, convolution, emergence of convolutional structure. Um, and the input data is obtained in this way. So, so the article actually is not based on some natural images from nature, it's based on some synthetic data that uh, models natural images. So um, the data vector for this nonlinear Gaussian process is given by uh, the formula right here. Uh, one over Z of G is a scaling factor and uh, Psi is a function that will uh, saturate the picture. So uh, our initial uh, vectors are uh, zero mean Gaussian vectors of length L and the covariance vector uh, matrix is given by uh, this expression. So as you can see uh, in this expression, um, the covariance matrix solely depends only on the positions of the uh, uh, pixels. So the difference- Okay, uh, and it's a, it's a two dimensional, it's a two yes. dimensional set of data. Uh, and so, and so there is locality already in, in right. this, in this Gaussian vector. You yes. call this Gaussian, right? Okay. 
Right. Right. Yeah. And uh, we'll we'll later show a choice of this function one over z of g. Uh, but for the time being, let me explain what g is. So g is called the um, gain factor. And as you can see in the picture, as the gain, it's a large gain factor results in images with sharp edges. You see these sharp edges. Otherwise, it's blur, blur, blurry. And um, large gain factor means there are important non-Gaussian statistics uh, uh, in the image. So images with small gain factor are close to Gaussian in distribution, while the uh, ones with bigger gain factor are not. Okay, um, so, so let me understand this better. So G, G is a parameter. Yes, uh, but Z, it's a parameter. Z inverse is an operator and Psi yeah. is, is a vector, right? Uh, Z inverse is actually, I, I did not want to write it as one over Z of G. It's, it's just a number. Okay. It's, 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 yeah, Z inverse it's, uh, is just a number. Psi is, 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 uh, is a function. function. It's a function on a vector which works coordinate wise. It's actually coordinate wise. So, so Z is a vector. Okay. Uh, yeah, here is here is then then, then uh, sorry so but then this is just a rescaling of the value. Can you just go back? Yeah. Then it's just rescale rescaling of values uh, of z by some some linear function. So it's not. Uh, so it's, so here is the function more clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, psi is this uh, r function, uh, and then g is. A number z i j are the uh, elements of the vector z mm -hmm. and um, z of g for example is given to be uh, okay so then we can think expression. about this operator is just uh you know, a layer that takes your gaussian signal and and uh, filters it through through this function yes yeah it's a normalization factor it's chosen okay. so that so, so all yeah, right. and, and, and then after that you're calling this a non-gaussian uh field are you no. Right. Yeah, it becomes known more and more non Gaussian as uh, as G increases. Uh, so when G is small, so for oh. small values of G, you know this this for small values of G, this is almost linear. Yeah. Or okay. yeah. This, this, this is actually a strange uh, <laughs> definition because um, like if you go back, the the, yeah. the the fact that this correlator depends on the exponent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is going to be changed so it's going to be a two-point correlator where the function is not exponent once you go through this filter but right. it's still going to be the two-point correlator that determines the entire field yeah exactly and yeah. for that reason we usually call it gaussian you know the two-point mm -hmm. function describes the entire random field this is usually called gaussian so if they call it non-gaussian it's 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 strange as at least in physics we would call it gaussian field with some uh, two-point correlation function, which isn't exponential, but something else. Okay, maybe this is just terminology. But yeah, I yeah. I understand what's done, yeah. Right, the entire paper is motivated by people who, with background in statistical physics, mostly in quantum mechanics, uh, which is actually not my background. Uh, but then they should have called it a Gaussian field, even after right. that filter. So I, that, that it, it's just wrong. It sounds- I see. Sounds wrong, but okay, go ahead. So um, yeah, so for small values of G, uh, the error function is almost linear um, uh, and the inputs are almost Gaussian, but for uh, higher values of G, we see this non-Gaussian behavior. Um, all right, so, so the inputs are divided into two classes. They are labeled by plus one and minus one and they differ by the correlation length, E plus minus. So this uh, psi, so this uh, C shows up right here, C mu. Uh, and um, the learning task consists in classifying inputs based on uh, these values. Um, so here are the short range correlations for the inputs with higher gain factor and the long, long range correlations with higher gain factor. And this is a Gaussian control. Same scenarios, but smaller G and smaller G. Okay, these are the training data set. Um, now, 
the yes, the Gaussian clone is obtained by drawing inputs with the same distribution uh, from a Gaussian distribution with zero mean and same covariance. Um, the output of the network is given by this expression where W um, is a matrix of first layer weights in the biases are BK uh, uh, for the hidden units. Um, so, uh, when, uh, so when we uh, run the network, we initialize, we first initialize W with some uh, independent identically distributed zero mean Gaussian entries that have variance one over D. Uh, unfortunately, I tried the code is not listed anymore on the website. So I was not able to uh, run the code and test this for myself, but I understand the theory. So in the future, maybe I can write to them and get the code. Um, so for a minimal model, we fix the second layer weights of the network to be one over K. Uh, um, and uh, we use plus, minus one and plus one as outputs for the two classes. Okay. Now the loss function is for simplicity, it's chosen to be the predicted mean square. And uh, it's given by this expression. The average is taken over the data distributions where X are the inputs and Y is either plus one or minus one. Uh, no, that's, uh, yeah. And then you train the network using uh, stochastic gradient descent um, using both online learning and uh, standard mini batch learning uh, from a finite data set. Um, other kinds of uh, last functions could have been chosen, but the expression becomes really complicated. Uh, still, you have the same conclusion. The main results do not change. Um, also, we could have used another uh, activation function. Uh, such so as value. Of, I, 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 about the loss. So is it the kind of autoencoder there? You're trying to, uh, or, or is it, or you have labeled data? You don't have labeled data, right? The, the input data are labeled. So it's binary classification with the input, you have plus one and minus ones. Uh, and so there are, imp, imp, there are two classes. Um, Gaussian and no Gaussian, is that? Yeah, uh, uh, basically plus one, minus one, meaning uh, short range, long range correlation. Um, and where is this parameter in the uh in the in the distribution of images this this y plus minus where does it appear there uh mu in slow mu this is where it comes from oh no and uh in the district yeah um so basically it's it, it's it's no this is just the parameter in, i now understand what they mean yeah. by gaussian they it's double gaussian actually <laughs> the probability distribution yeah. of Gaussian because it, it depends on two-point correlation function and, and the correlation function itself is Gaussian. Okay, but then they have this yeah. parameter that takes you, keeps one Gaussianity, the field theory still uh, depends on only two-point correlation function, but now you change this correlation yeah. function, which is not Gaussian. Okay, but this is just still right. a set of images that are drawn from a certain distribution. There is no label, yes. labeling for it. There is leveling. Actually, there is leveling. So the inputs are divided into two classes, level oh, high. Um, so I don't see it as part of the formulation. That's why I, I was not able to tell that from the formulation, but I think it's in the data. In the code they were running, I believe. Um, That's important, was, right? Because, you know, what yeah. kind of classification tasks they do. All right. So maybe then, then can we get to the... Uh, you know yeah okay final. so so the so so after we run this network we have uh we run the model we have uh some results and these results actually do not uh change uh for example if you train the second layer so emergence of receptive fields also occurs when the second layers are also trained uh from scratch so these are some important notes but for simplification uh, we're, we, we're using the predicted mean square, only training the first layer and uh, fix, fixing the second one, the, by, uh, the weights for the second one. And um, uh, yeah, 
Um, so here are the results. Um, so for the Gaussian control expert task, we have a two layer uh, network, a convolutional neural network composed of a convolutional layer uh, with some padding. Um, and then it's and then that's followed uh, followed by a, a fully connected layer with linear input output. Okay, so after learning, this is what happens. Um, the hidden neurons um, have split into two groups in both cases. So where half of the neurons, these are just four neurons, uh, um, act as detectors for inputs with long range uh, correlation. So these are like detectors for long range correlation. So the picture comes from uh, uh, some way of presenting uh, the neurons. It's described in the paper. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so in the top figure, what we see is the weight vectors or, or what we call the receptive fields of these four neurons. And um, Uh, the neurons that detect the short range correlations uh, are, are very different. They have de very different uh, representations. They are uh, highly oscillatory receptive fields or patterns. So, but let me just start to understand. Uh, so the, the split of the hidden neurons into the yeah. ones that keep track of local correlators and global yeah. correlators, is this persist for... Uh, all models they consider like you know more gaussian less gaussian yes. uh no uh, more Ga only more gaussian so here is a gaussian control experiment where g is small so in this yeah. case there is no localized field it's not localized so here you have so some for gaussian you don't have localized correlators no not necessarily no but for non gaussian which we call by the gaussian probably the ones that have those edges right somehow yeah yeah, yeah. And, and here that one does have some uh localization structure and locality emerge right well i I, yes. I would i would still think that in the other case you should also have the locality emerge but may it may take a long time because you know the picture mm -hmm. is local there is still a local correlator it is still decaying you know exponentially uh, it may yeah. be a florid a picture but there is still uh, correlations are still have a local form but okay right that, but we can we can quantify this so you can quantify yeah. this so, so i think the, the main the main point here so you're considering uh gaussian random fields with, right uh, described by two-point correlators and you right. said that be, depending on the shape of this two-point correlator the locality and the convolutional structure may or may not emerge fast right that, that that makes yeah. sense Exactly. Yeah. And uh, this is this actually answers a major open problem in machine learning because, they're, they're, uh, you know, the standard paradigm is just minimizing a loss function via first order methods. But this says we have to use second order or higher order statistics to be able to see uh, emergent, you know, properties. So we can actually quantify the localization of uh, these receptive fields by computing the inverse participation ratio. Uh, this is similar to kurtosis. So the inverse participation ratio for a vector is just the sum of the four powers of the coordinates divided by the square of the length of the vector. So it quantifies the amount of non-zero components of a vector. So uh, for example, in this picture, so the IPR is large for localized receptive fields. After some time, after uh, uh, so this train learning time. So there is a definition for the learning time. The learning time is just uh, the number of the uh, gradient descent steps uh, divided by total input size. Um, uh, and you see, you see the IPR increases. Uh, after some learning uh, 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 by the model. So um, while um, in the Gaussian case, it doesn't, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah, it stays flat. Yeah. So uh, the localized neurons, they develop the, a large IPR over time, 
And the learning is actually sequential. It doesn't happen at the beginning, but it's sequential. And the IPR of those neurons with, uh, uh, say, oscillatory uh, receptive fields uh, yeah. remains very small. Yeah. So, yeah, but what I'm saying that if you wait long enough for even that blurred picture, this uh, orange line may, may also go up. Uh, and, and yeah, that would yeah. We'll, we'll just say, yeah, it just takes longer to learn uh, for that field that it is actually a local field, and the other one right. learned it very fast, and that all depends on the two point correlate, right? Yeah, in the Gaussian case, the orange one did not go up even after 10,000 uh, sure, units sure. of learning time, so it may eventually, but it, not in practical terms, sure. Okay, yeah. so, um the network with 100 hidden neurons reaches some 98% prediction accuracy. Uh, uh, and uh, actually the same network achieved a slightly inferior prediction, which I tried to, to find out to be, I think 90%, which is not as bad. Mm -hmm. So it's a slightly inferior prediction accuracy. And uh, the receptive fields are not localized and the IPR stays zero for the Gaussian case. Um, so, so we see from here that the convolutional structure uh, emerged from the fact that the game factor was higher. Very good. Thanks. Yeah. Are there any questions? Oh, oh no, I'm, uh, there oh, is a few. Actually, there are there is a few more. Uh, let me take two All more right. minutes. So. Um, so these receptive fields, they look like the filters learned by a convolutional linear network. Um, and also, uh, first analysis shows that uh, uh, the FC networks we trained uh, show uh, weight sharing, which is a second characteristic of um, convolutional linear networks. And, uh, oops. Yeah, so the higher order moments of this uh, nonlinear Gaussian process uh, uh, starts influencing learning only at a later stage, which means um, uh, the Gaussian theory does not break down at the beginning, but the way we explain this learning process breaks down after uh, uh, some time. Mm -hmm. So this is also explained in the paper. Um, there is a nice analysis of the learning dynamics they propose uh, a new theoretical model uh, using a single neuron. It uses some tensor decomposition. It's it, it's very interesting. Uh, it sounds like a new way of looking at this learning dynamics. I'm interested in presenting this in the future if there is mm -hmm. um, interest. Uh, so uh, uh, I did not just gonna wanna gloss over the details uh, about the tensor decomposition in a few minutes this time, but. I'll be very happy to present uh, at a later date. Perfect. Thank you, Vikram. Um, oh, thank you. Any okay. questions? Comments, questions? Well, uh, my, my only comment would be that uh, it is interest. Well, first of all, we have to figure out what, what is the actual classification was. Uh, oh, it's, yeah, binary classification. But, but uh, assuming that there is some clever way of doing this, it seems like they are saying that uh, this result of, of when or if the locality emerges and convolutional structure emerges depends on the two-point correlation function. And if that's true, uh, that, that would be nice to see uh, study more of, uh, on the shape of the correlation function. So, you know, there is one Gaussian shape but there are many non-gaussian shapes for the two point right. function and so it would be nice to see uh, how it shape affects these conclusions that's one comment and the second one uh maybe other um non-convolutional structures emerge which may be local or non-local but not necessarily the ones that are used in the convolutional neural networks uh, that would be also interesting to see 
Yeah, this area seems to be very open. There is lots of un unanswered questions. Oh, I, I think I, I think in fact yeah. to connect it to the first talk today, it's it's all about emergence, right? And use yeah. use of symmetries. Uh, the convolutional structures emerge because there are symmetry. There is a local space of those images. There is a shift symmetry, and and the same uh, the um, relevant um, invariants were useful for the self driving cars for the autonomous particles because there is uh, Galilean symmetry and permutation symmetry. So in both cases, it seems like uh, symmetries play the key role, whether you uh, derive those symmetries and you then use them, or you see how they emerge through learning. Right. Right. Okay, let's see if there are any questions. I think I have one minor nitpick as well. Um, Go ahead. Using the particular correlator structure they did for these non-Gaussian images is somewhat surprising to me because I think people have dis people have sort of observed that natural images take on a power law correlation. I'm not sure if that particular mm -hmm. uh, yeah. outcome changes the results here. I mean, eyes do seem to have receptive fields, but you know, it's it's an interesting it's interesting yeah. that they chose not to do that and then call it a model of natural images. Right. Yeah, that, that's a that's a good point. Uh, so it is true that in many natural images and in, in uh, complex enough systems, you have scale invariants and power law like correlators. Um, and, and, and then to see whether whether that type of correlators, you can easily general, generate images with such correlators, wh how the, you know, the powerness of the correlators affects the, the uh, the appearance of the convolutional structure. Yeah, I agree. This would be very interesting. So, so maybe your proposal would be if you are to compare Gaussian and non-Gaussian, uh, take non-Gaussians, the ones that are described by power laws, and then it would be an interesting comparison rather than precisely, just, yeah, uh, rather than just imposing ad hoc function that just does something to Gaussian. What's not right? right. Yeah, that that, that make, makes total sense. I agree. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. If there are no Thank questions, you. I'll stop recording.